Hello and welcome everyone to the first in an exciting new series of live educational broadcasts treating the invisible injuries of war, veterans, families, and care providers. I'm Joseph Bobro, the founder of the Coming Home Project. On behalf of Coming Home, the Health Effects of War Grand Rounds at the University of California, San Francisco, and UT UCTV, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you, whether you're watching at UCSF, on TV, or on the internet, whether you are in Florida, New York, Oklahoma, North Carolina, Arizona, or California, whether you reside in a big city, a small town, or a rural community, we are glad to have you with us today. What unites us is our interest in coming together to learn with and support one another as we work with Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and their families. Most of us are offering our professional services pro bono as part of grassroots organizations such as the Coming Home Project, Give an Hour, the Soldiers Project, and the Returning Veterans Project. We also want to welcome our friends and colleagues at the VAs, the Vet Centers, at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and other military medical and treatment centers around the country. Some of you joining us today may not be psychotherapists, but you nonetheless are providing critically important services to vets and families, including counseling, case management, advocacy, making connections, opening doors, and accessing, accessing needed services and providing vitally important support. Welcome to you all. Our coming together today represents an important cultural shift. If we want our veterans and their families to reintegrate back into life in productive ways, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally, then we must be the change we wish to see, as Gandhi said. We must become an interconnected web of safety and dynamic responsive harmony, a net out of which no one is left to fall. We must talk to one another, learn and grow together, share ideas and resources, create new projects, and work shoulder to shoulder. If we cannot, how can we expect our vets and family members to talk to one another, to cooperate and heal with one another? How can we expect their bodies, minds, hearts, and spirits to reawaken and communicate fruitfully once again in wholeness? If our relationships with one another are fragmented, based solely on territorial and self-serving interests, and the chilling dictum, stay in your own lane, how can we create a culture of responsive compassion and relational conditions where the deepest wounds of war can be held and transformed, where psyche, soma, and spirit, veteran and family, and veteran, family, and the culture at large can come together once again. Founded in 2006, the Coming Home Project is a group of veterans, psychotherapists, and interfaith leaders devoted to helping Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and their families and care providers transform the psychological, emotional, spiritual, and relationship injuries of war. We do this by helping rebuild the connectivity of mind, heart, body, and spirit that combat trauma can unravel, renew relationships with loved ones, and create new support networks. Our programs integrate psychological, mindfulness, and expressive approaches as we build a community and a culture of belonging, acceptance, mutual support, and compassion. We offer a range of services, innovative retreats, 
psychological counseling, including support groups and psychoeducational classes, training and self-care for care providers and veteran service organizations, and public educational forums. An inclusive, accepting, respectful, and non-judgmental atmosphere is a hallmark of coming home programs. Our services for veterans and families are free and confidential, and all are welcome without regard to their political or religious beliefs. I want to express my sincere thanks to all those who made this series possible. And now, without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed presenter, Dr. John Briere. John Briere has been working for decades uh, at the leading edge of trauma research, training, and um, creating new paradigms. His approaches are interdisciplinary and uh, refreshingly humanistic. Dr. Briere is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Psychology at the Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California, the Director of the Psychological Trauma Program at the Los Angeles County and USC Medical Center, and co-director of the Miller Child Abuse and Violence Intervention Center and USC Child and Adolescent Trauma Program, National Trial, Child Traumatic Stress Network. He's a past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and recipient of the Robert S. Laufer Memorial Award for Scientific Achievement from ISTSS, as well as the Outstanding Professional Award from the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. Designated as highly cited researcher by the Institute for Scientific Information, he is the author or co-author of over 70 articles, 20 chapters and encyclopedia entries, 10 books and 8 psychological tests in the areas of trauma, child abuse and interpersonal violence. He has consulted and provided training to many Veterans Administration Centers, the Department of Defense, and the Navy Family Advocacy Program on Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan veterans and active duty personnel. And Dr. Briere was an ongoing consultant to the U.S. Navy Recruit Project from 1991 to 2000. His newest book, co-authored with Catherine Scott, is Principles of Trauma Therapy, published by Sage Publications. His website is johnbriere.com. It is my pleasure to present my friend John Briere, who will speak on Therapy with War-Related Trauma, Five Central Principles. Thank you. We uh, have roughly an hour initially to cover uh, quite a lot of material. I'm basically, we'll just touch on things and sort of see how they go. There are, though, I think a good way to look at this is divided into five central principles that people who are working with uh, war veterans of, of, from any war might want to adhere to. Uh, these principles are obviously not exhaustive, but I, I think they capture some of the issues that maybe are most relevant to working with people who have experienced significant combat trauma. And as you'll see on the first slide, uh, it says five principles. Let me just go over briefly what those principles are. Again, entirely made up. Uh, the first one is, if you weren't there, it's probably worse than you think. The second one is, be prepared for more than combat exposure. There may be the effects of engaging in combat. This uh, refers to the impacts on the human being of, of killing or hurting other people. Uh, expect pre-war trauma exposure and significant comorbidity, meaning that uh, we aren't just looking at a specific battle or, or engagement or war impact on the veteran, but also perhaps uh, events that occurred prior to war for that individual uh, and may involve symptoms that exceed uh, the most obvious post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Um, another idea which goes more directly to the treatment component is that there are probably two general ways in which we can facilitate uh, the recovery of people who have been exposed to war trauma. One is to use uh, something we call exposure therapy, which is asking the veteran to go over painful material in a safe environment in a relatively direct and, and uh, sort of personal way. Uh, 
it turns out that doing that is, is efficacious in reducing the ability of memories to produce distress over time. Uh, and we also, I would suggest you focus more on affect regulation than some uh, treatment programs do. Affect regulation refers to our relative ability to not be overwhelmed by painful internal experiences, including painful trigger memories from the past. Uh, so one of the things that we'll be talking a little bit more about here today is the notion that uh, we want to do a certain kind of exposure, and then we also want to add to that some ways in which we can increase the veteran's ability to tolerate uh, the ex experiences that he or she has been through. And then lastly, and very importantly, we want to utilize partners, families, peers, and organizations in working uh, with the combat veteran. Uh, this is a piece that although Coming Home and other groups uh, like that group emphasize is unfortunately overlooked in many treatment approaches, and as we will discuss very briefly, uh, that's making probably a fairly central error in working with people who have been traumatized because support and, uh, and different sources of input and different ways of relating to the veteran uh, turn out to be very important in his or her recovery from traumatic uh, exposure. Okay, the, the first of those five principles again was if you weren't there, it's probably worse than you think. Um, it may not be. It may be that you have a full uh, understanding of what it's like over there, but one of the things that Vietnam veterans have discussed Iraq veterans have discussed, and certainly people from Afghanistan have discussed, uh, is that in some sense there is a sort of what we could call a phenomenologic gap or a, a lack of full and complete understanding of the experience between the helper and the person was actually in the war zone. The reality is that war is a relatively, it, it's an event that, that has its own reality internally. Uh, it is not one that makes a lot of sense necessarily to people outside of the war environment. The problem solving that goes on there, the decisions, reactions, responses that people in war go through uh, can't easily be apprehended by family members or even therapists. And I think that uh, on some level we have to acknowledge that and, and take it into account that in some sense the non war therapist or family member is in a different world than the combat veteran is. And that doesn't make the world of the veteran sicker or anything else. It just means that, uh, that we don't have as much of a base of experience in common as we sometimes think. This, unfortunately, has been exacerbated, I believe, uh, in the Iraq and Afghanistan scenario because our government, for whatever reasons, and I have my own opinions, but that's not what this is on, uh, has uh, limited to a great extent the amount of media coverage of uh, of Iraq veterans and, and in some sense has limited our uh, awareness of, of the war dead and has, has really, in some sense, I would say, decreased our awareness of the huge numbers of wounded individuals that have left Afghanistan and Iraq. And so although this may have a political calculus involved in it uh, that allows the administration to do uh, what it is doing, um, the net effect on those of us back home is that we don't really have very much information. Uh, certainly if you compared media coverage uh, and uh, sort of photo opportunities of the, of the president and others interacting uh, with combat veterans and with war dead in Vietnam, there was a huge amount more information then than there is now. And the net effect of that is that uh, I think that we're all sort of in a bit of an information gap here which again exacerbates that notion that many people have very little understanding of what it must be like to, to be in these war environments. Another thing that is unfortunately true for the last few wars that we have been involved in is the fact that uh, the, the older war idea of, of fighting at a, you know, and having specific battle lines and, and war fronts, et cetera, and the enemy was over there and you were over here, and uh, you know, there were fairly clear rules about who to shoot at, who you were supposed to be dealing with. They look different than the people that you're supposed to be defending. They look different than you perhaps had a different language, et cetera. Those kinds of notions of a more sort of structured war have fallen by the wayside in the last few wars and certainly is highly relevant to the experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. What researchers and theorists of war have come to as a conclusion is the extent to which war involves insurgency, hand-to-hand -hand combat, an absence of clear battle lines, uh, 
Low enemy discrimination, meaning you can't really tell the good guys from the bad guys other than yourselves um, in terms of the country that you're involved in. The net effect of this kind of confusion and chaos is that uh, the war experience can be more brutal, it can be more confusing, it can be um, harder for people who are fighting a war over an extended period of time to maintain high morale because on some level it's very hard to sort of see the ongoing unfolding of the war in some meaningful way. It starts to appear to be a chaotic, dangerous, and often quite upsetting and numbing experience that's repeating day after day after day. In some sense, if you know who you're fighting against, then you have some way to maintain a boundary between yourself and the enemy, or between yourself and what you have to do in your war uh, duties. But when the person behind you could be the enemy, the person in front of you could, you're driving down a road and it's just a road, and then suddenly uh, it's, it's, a, it's an explosive bomb. These kinds of coming out of left field, not being able to predict what's going on events, uh, take a considerable toll. And that is why some uh, war theoreticians have suggested that the last several wars may produce more mental health impacts than previous wars, above and beyond whether those wars happen to be popular or unpopular. And, you know, we do have obviously data in this regard about Iraq for those clinicians and family members who, who, who are there when the, when the Iraq and Afghanistan folks come back, which is the that we start to hear stories, and these stories are extremely hard to share for the veteran, very hard to hear for certainly family members and others, but uh, even for therapists, very difficult stories. And those conditions and events are, in some sense, not easily transmissible, because, in fact, we're living, again, in sort of different worlds. An experience that I've often seen is watching a veteran trying to explain to a therapist or to a family member what it was really like over there, what decisions they really had to make, what the actual on-the-ground uh, characteristics of the situation were. They're often violent, they're often sometimes uh, very, very upsetting uh, material that they're sharing. It also, though, is very hard to talk to someone who's not in war about what war is like. Again, that there's a phenomenologic or a, like a sort of a reality split between people who have been there and people who have not. A point that sometimes is made in some presentations, but often is not, I'd like to make it here, however, uh, is that um, the more we study the human in war, the more we begin to understand that he or she is not only traumatized by being shot at, by, uh, by being hurt, by being in great danger, by being frightened, uh, or by watching one's colleagues or peers, friends, unit members, whomever, be hurt or killed in front of you. Those things obviously do produce mass amounts of trauma in a, a very large number of people. The more we look at that, this, this, the more we come to understand that humans probably aren't really made to kill each other under circumstances that exceed personal reasons. So the, probably the wiring of the human being is such that under certain circumstances we're prepared to kill to protect our family, our partner, perhaps our property. But one of the things that war does is, of course, it takes it out of the personal domain and makes it something that we're doing for political reasons or for patriotic reasons. Uh, leaving aside for a minute whether that's a, a reasonable perspective, and certainly you could argue that it would be, the reality, nevertheless, for many warriors is that when they find themselves in war, they're fighting against people they've never met, for whom they have no actual issue with one way or the other. Uh, and in fact, when they then engage in killing that individual or attacking that individual or being involved in some kind of a violent interchange with that individual, and I'm trying to avoid all the jargon here and look more just at what it's like at the human level, when you have to do things like that to people, uh, what we're beginning to understand is that that has its own impact on the veteran. And I think it's a really big issue that we can't avoid. And it certainly emerged a lot in Vietnam. It, it emerged in Vietnam primarily, though, in the context of atrocities. Uh, and I've spent some time working with folks and supervising the treatment of folks who've been engaged in atrocities. Very important thing to think about and, and to work with. However, there's all this stuff that wouldn't necessarily be called atrocity, but still involves just being involved in an awful lot of killing, a lot of hurting people.
And to the extent that that exceeds the normal human ability to, to absorb that kind of stuff, what you get is trauma by killing as opposed to only trauma by being hurt or watching other people be killed. Various writers have pointed out that, um, that this issue, the issue of humans not really being surprisingly not willing to kill other people unless it's very personal, means that the military has to use various training approaches and uh, motivational techniques to try to get to people to do things they wouldn't normally do, i.e. Uh, fight with individuals for whom they have no personal issue. Uh, generally, the military does this by various types of training, various types of, of, of indoctrination in the sense of, of, of characterizing the enemy as, um, you know, as an enemy in some ways, as someone who's a threat to the homeland, someone who is bad in whatever way. Uh, and each war, it has been suggested, uh, the military has gotten a little bit better at getting people to bypass their own inhibitions to kill other people. Some people believe that the Iraq and Afghanistan uh, scenarios are perhaps the ones where you see this at its highest level, where individuals are killing people uh, without really hardly, with very little actual understanding of why they need to kill that person at that specific moment, or what the war is actually about, or what they're actually doing there. Uh, the, there would obviously be the human impact of that anyway, that if you are, find yourself in a situation where you are now doing things you would not normally do, let's say that you were a uh, mechanic you know, a year ago and now you've just been involved in a battle where there were multiple fatalities and you were involved in several of them, um, that would be hard for probably anyone or at least many people. One of the technical problems with war, though, is when, when the warrior is through doing their war thing, and they return back to the civilian world, they return back to the system of beliefs, expectations, and understandings involved in that civilian world. And those things that, while in war may have seemed acceptable, may have made sense in the context of the military in terms of, of whatever might be thought of as the war effort, those those issues re return when, in fact, the military operation is no longer active. The net effect of this is that many of us have seen young men and women who did things in war that they felt were appropriate for someone who was in war, but when they returned back um, to wherever they normally lived, they were struck with a tremendous sense of guilt, self-blame, shame, other kinds of feelings associated with how could I have done that? What was I thinking? In this way, we almost see a strange mixture of the fact that the civilian may not know what the warrior has gone through, and therefore the civilian's appreciation of the warrior's experience may be incomplete. In some sense, it almost happens within the same person when the person returns back to a civilian world and then has to process and think about and remember some of the things that they did during war. Uh, this again, one of the things here that, uh, that makes this more complicated as well is the notion of how, what are you allowed to do in war? And how, how do you, if you have to kill people, how do you kill people? How do you treat prisoners? What do you do when you encounter areas of the terrain where there are people that you don't know if they're good guys or they're bad guys, but you are, you're under fire and, you're, and you're, you know, you're aware that there could be great danger there? Uh, the, the problem with guerrilla insurgent hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, no battle line worlds is that the line between what is acceptable in war and what others may call atrocity later on uh, may be rather relatively hazy. Uh, one of the sort of the, the experiences a lot of us I have had who have worked with war veterans is this realization that in many cases a lot of things that probably civilians would call atrocities have never really come to civilian attention for a variety of reasons. The problem for the vet, besides the fact that, of course, that would be a horrendous thing to be involved in, is that when you return home, you're now stuck with what it was like, what you did, and to some extent, who you believe that you were. If you were a mechanic, you never hurt anyone, and now you've hurt a bunch of people and you've killed some people, and you're now back in San Francisco or Oklahoma, what do you do now? Especially if some of the things that you were involved in would be things that civilians, 
would view to be atrocities or viewed uh, as, in some sense, uh, over the top even for war. Were it not enough that, that people were in the situation we're describing here, that, that people uh, are engaged in activities that involve uh, being hurt, witnessing their colleagues being hurt, and hurting others, perhaps, we also have the fact that we have generally looked at that as war trauma and have said that if someone is, shows post-traumatic difficulties after or they've returned from war, that it must be that the war did that to them. And of course, in many cases, there's a lot of truth to that. But the more that we've looked at this, and we've especially looked at this in the Vietnam War because we've had a lot of time since it ended to, to examine veterans and see what their experiences were. Uh, one of the things that is slowly becoming more and more clear to us is that many veterans of war who manifest or show up with negative post-traumatic outcomes after war may already have been at risk for those symptoms even prior to war. In fact, they may have had some symptoms pre-war. Um, part of this is because if you just look at any group of people who go to war, there's going to be a significant number of those people who have had previous traumas, especially traumas in childhood, physical abuse, sexual abuse, etc., and who have been involved in various altercations or victimization experiences with peers prior to going into war. However, what a number of us have shown in studies, uh, which is a, a, a pretty significant issue, uh, is that actually those who volunteer or to go to war often have a greater rate of childhood physical and sexual abuse and a greater likelihood of trauma prior to joining the military. So we don't have to really get into numbers here, but for instance, the Navy Recruit Project, which ran for many years and was a, a study of quite a large number of men and women, uh, revealed relatively high rates of childhood trauma in those groups. Uh, you know, on some level it may be that if you did have a very chaotic and difficult childhood, maybe the military is a family, or you're hoping it's a family for you. Maybe uh, it's a way to feel like you have people who are on your side and and seeing the same thing you're doing. Maybe you've wanted to have a brother or a sister by your side who, you know, who would be your comrade and, and who, whom would share experiences with, et cetera. Um, and I think for some people, part of the idea is if you join the Army or the Navy and the Marines or whatever, that you will find more structure than you had in your life, that you were sort of stuck in a chaotic world before, but there'll be rules in the military and there'll be laws and things will be very clear be a command chain, et cetera, and you will, you will know what you should do. Uh, th it's fully understandable that people would think that. Unfortunately, what happens is that what this may mean is that if a significant number of the people that we see who are showing war trauma are actually presenting with a combination of the effects of childhood difficulties, childhood abuse and neglect, and later war experiences so that the outcome that they have is much more complex. So what we can generally say here is that especially perhaps in the vet who's having a more difficult time, whose symptoms are seemingly more chronic, who is uh, having a wider range of symptoms perhaps, not all of which are simply post-traumatic, uh, that those individuals are probably experiencing what in the field now is referred to as complex trauma, which is the interaction between early traumas and later traumas. Uh, when you have that stuff coming together, when you have different ba levels of trauma, that some of which was war-related and some wasn't, what you'll find is the person will have a full range of symptoms, which may exceed by far what our earlier study of war veterans told us. Uh, and again, the reason that we get this kind of complexity is because we're looking at not only the effects of war, but things that occurred before war, plus the interaction between those early traumas and war experiences. And as you'll note on this slide, there are just a wide range of things that you can see that, that will, may show up in combat veterans who have these more complex symptom presentations. Uh, among the obviously are anger, depression, and anxiety. Uh, generally in people who've been exposed to war, anger is, is, is quite an obvious emotional state. Um, people who treat war veterans are often struck by the extent to which anger is part of the clinical picture. 
In addition to that anger, which may, by the way, be a free-floating, generalized angry experience as well as the ability to be triggered into a rage state relatively quickly for seemingly small reasons or as a result of flashbacks to, to war. In addition to that, though, many veterans will be struggling with anxiety of various types of anxiety disorders and often with some level of depression. Uh, in my experience, that depression may manifest as a diagnostic, uh, you know, DSM-4 diagnosis of major depression but even when it doesn't intensify to the point of major depression, the underlying level of, of depression or dysthymia or dysphoria that the individual is experiencing can be pretty ongoing. These three outcomes, anger, depression, and anxiety, are not diagnosed as much as a post-traumatic state, yet often when you talk to the family members of veterans, or you talk to people who have spent time with war veterans, they will note that these, this is part of the major presentation of these individuals, that they're, they're, they're unhappy, they're angry, they're scared, they're sad. And because those are not classically we un, what we understand post-traumatic stress disorder to be, they're often overlooked, uh, or they, even the veteran may feel that these are things to be suppressed because of their evidence of some greater, more general failing as opposed to the effects of war. Of course, the reality is that war does produce these feelings. In fact, it turns out that depression, for example, is probably considerably more common than PTSD in people who have been exposed to major trauma. So we really need to think about those kinds of, of emotional states. Substance abuse is obviously been shown over and over again to be a common outcome for those exposed to war, involved in war. It's also a outcome associated with earlier childhood abuse and neglect. So what you find is that some individuals post-military will be quite involved in alcohol or drugs uh, for a variety of different reasons. And the general sense we have of this, and of course it varies from person to person, but the general sense we have of this is that the use of drugs or alcohol is an attempt to self-medicate, a way to bring down the amount of emotional distress, the anger, depression, anxiety, as well as the known properties of alcohol and drugs to, to some extent, block the experience of activated memory material. So a lot of folks involved in war will drink or use drugs relatively frequently as a way to maintain some level of homeostasis where they can try to sort of disconnect from the parts of the brain that are projecting and presenting movie after movie after movie of the horrors of war. Aggression is also more common among combat vets and war veterans than some other trauma survivors, for example, but is also an effect generally of complex uh, exposure to rotten things in your life. And aggression uh, is sometimes overrated in returning veterans because uh, for a variety of reasons, I think including sometimes our own guilt, uh, civilians have a tendency to typify the combat vet as being an aggressive person, as being a dangerous person. And of course, that's not a fair characterization. On the other hand, for those individuals who are experiencing a lot of anger, whose anger can be triggered by some small nuance in the interpersonal environment or some thing in the environment that, that, that triggers a flashback, for those individuals you can get greater levels of aggression and for some individuals this aggression uh, will be directed towards their own families or towards other people in their environment, if not um, strangers in their environment. More broadly, a pretty central impact of sustained trauma of the type that one often sees in war, especially when it interacts with childhood and negative events, is the general problem of interpersonal disturbance, the difficulty in forming a sense of intimacy and connectedness, or of having intimacy without sexualizing it, or of having issues wherein you feel easily misunderstood or criticized, or feeling abandoned by people. Um, there's many aspects of war and often especially this was true for the Vietnam a cohort, the notion of returning from war and being rejected then by people that you thought that you were fighting for. Uh, but besides that specific Vietnam experience, the general sense that for many individuals, war is the opposite of interpersonal relatedness and that it requires a different way of being in order to be a good warrior. And that the effect of that over time is that you may start to associate relationships with negative feelings.
Uh, that you, you, maybe you didn't trust people that much before you went to war, perhaps especially if you came from a history of child abuse and neglect. And then when war comes, war is not generally going to necessarily be a thing that's going to cause you to trust people more. For some people, for instance, women, we know that women in, in, uh, in the armed services actually have a fairly significant rate of being sexually victimized by their own, by their own colleagues. Uh, but there's a general sort of a sense sometimes that you really can't trust uh, uh, people when you're involved in these kinds of scenarios and that this lack of trust can become very, very powerful. What some of us have discovered is some of these interpersonal effects are almost sort of like a form of flashback, which is that the individual may be doing fine in their relationship, in their, in their workplace, etc. But when some specific combination of interpersonal events come together, like someone says the wrong thing or gives the wrong look or doesn't respond in the way that the, the individual wanted them to or whatever, you get this very strong cognitive emotional reaction that will result in behaviors that will generally not support ongoing relationships that may involve um, uh, verbally uh, lashing out. They may involve the individual isolating themselves, any one of a number of things. And the, the notion of affect regulation here, which is probably a fairly complex construct, the longer we talk about it, the more complicated it seems to be getting. But if we said that affect regulation is your relative ability to, to, to bring yourself out of a negative state relatively quickly or to be able to tolerate distressing material without being overwhelmed, you know, this general notion that we all have that we have to some extent a relative ability or less ability to downregulate distress and to tolerate distress. This notion of affect regulation uh, is important here because both combat and pre-military traumas can affect affect regulation capacity as far as we know. We certainly know that individuals who were abused as children may have more trouble in regulating their emotional states and they may get overwhelmed and they may then quote act out or have to do something else to reduce the amount of emotional distress that they're feeling. We also know that war can dysregulate emotional states in some individuals. So the constant experience of being on edge, of being in danger, the, 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 the day by day, week by week, month by month, deployment by deployment experience of terror and, 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 and the various things that, that, that people involved in war experience can have, can over time reduce that individual's ability to absorb negative experiences without becoming very reactive or, or by being in one way or another overwhelmed. So this notion of affect regulation is an important one in, the, in working with veteran cohorts because what we see is quite a lot of problems in this area that individuals uh, can get overreactive, if you wish. They can, quote, act out. They can be, quote, impulsive. They can have very strong emotional reactions to seemingly not very powerful triggers. Uh, they may be besieged by ongoing post-traumatic hyperarousal, ongoing depression. And these things may make them feel sort of like they're on a roller coaster emotionally, that, they're, that, that they flip from one emotional state to the next to the next. Uh, not only is this uh, an issue that may be difficult in therapy, uh, it's also obviously an issue that's problematic for lots of family members who are, are watching uh, an individual who just seems quite different from the individual that left who went to war, and part of that being the, the very strong emotional outbursts and other kinds of reactions that they have. And lastly, and, and uh, I, I sometimes it looks like there's not enough attention paid to this, is the fact that combat-related post-traumatic stress can involve the additional symptoms of psychosis, so much so that some of us were recommending a new diagnosis for DSM-5, PTSD with psychotic features. Uh, research indicates that a really significant minority of, uh, of men right now who are in inpatient facilities with a VA as a result of combat exposure in Vietnam have psychotic symptoms. It's not a very rare phenomenon. It's a significantly common phenomenon to, to cause us to wonder what is the relationship between trauma and psychosis uh, and to, under, to question how could we help people who are having these symptoms that are classically understood as being something else entirely. Uh, our normal understanding of psychosis is that it's schizophrenia, or something related to that, or major depressive disorder with mood congruent psychotic features or something. But what we actually know is that you can develop transient psychotic symptoms and maybe chronic psychotic symptoms 
if you're continuously stressed at a high enough level for a long enough period of time. So we, psychosis is something we have to kind of keep in mind here, uh, certainly one that people working in the VAs confront on a regular basis. One of the things, obviously, that, that we have to, to ask ourselves right now is how can we be most helpful for the vet clinically in terms of providing therapies that are going to be specifically tailored to their war experience or the pre-war experience so that we can assist them in the ways that they're presenting post-war. Um, and the, the, the big name of the game right now in the trauma field is the notion of therapeutic exposure. So let's just talk about that very briefly talk about it more in the second hour. Therapeutic exposure refers to asking the client or the patient to talk about a painful event in relatively great detail in the context of a psychotherapy session where they're also hopefully feeling safe and where in some sense the therapist is keeping the material from getting too overwhelming. So therapeutic exposure is exposing the client to the memories of their traumatic events, in this case war trauma, and then working with them to process the associated emotional responses and the cognitive responses that emerge when they do remember what happened to them. The general way that people talk about exposure in the trauma world is something called prolonged exposure, which is that you expose people to fairly detailed and intensive memories of their past, uh, and that in the process of them sitting with that pain and not, in fact, anything really horrible happening to them, and in the context of the safety of the relationship, that those emotional states associated with the memory are thought to habituate or just desensitize. And that's, you know, that does work in many cases. But the problem that we have for people who have been exposed to an awful lot of trauma, and especially those who don't have as much of that affect regulation that I was referring to earlier, is that for such individuals, what looks like good therapy, which would be to expose someone to traumatic material, may in fact be re-traumatizing. It may be overwhelming. And so the, the job that the therapist has here is unenviable, certainly, which is how do I provide enough exposure to accomplish what has been shown in multiple studies to be effective in working with trauma, but not provide so much exposure that I overwhelm the individual and typically they shut down or they drop out of therapy or they do something else to try to cope with the fact that they're being so overwhelmed. So what that means is that we have to, on some level, uh, work out another way to do exposure, a way that, that uh, can address the fact that people have had chronic repetitive traumas, will have very high levels of emotional distress associated with memories, that they may have come from child abuse environments or other environments where they were deprived of the opportunity to develop very good affect regulation skills. And then a couple of small but very interesting studies indicating that if exposure activates a huge amount of guilt or shame that may also be problematic clinically. When we, you take all those conditions together, what we then have to do is figure out a new way to f do this exposure thing. And what we recommend here is something called titrated exposure. And what titrated exposure means is that we ask, you, we ask the client to talk about what they can handle, keeping them from being overwhelmed, not you know, kind of controlling the amount of exposure so that they uh, are remembering at a level that's going to be helpful to them but they're not being flooded with so many memories that the therapeutic process gets derailed. The client starts using avoidance strategies and basically shuts down. So in regards to this notion of titrated exposure, that would be the first step. The first step would be, okay, how can we do therapy with these guys and gals in a way that allows them to take their histories at a pace that they can handle it, talk about it when they can talk about it, not talk about it when they don't want to talk about it, probably more uh, longer-term therapy involving more opportunities to, to sort of explore what one's history is without going through some sort of a mechanized, rigid, remember this, remember that, remember this, sort of a more humanitarian way of looking at the, at, the, at, the, at the trauma survivor's history. I'm not saying those involved in prolonged exposure aren't humanitarian. It's just saying that when you're talking to, to people who have such heavy loads of distress, and potentially less capacity to regulate that distress, we're probably going to want to do that very carefully, with a lot of respect, and in a titrated, controlled sort of way. What we also talk about here, though, is the notion of developing what we can call affect regulation skills. And you may be familiar with this in terms of Marsha Linehan's work or other people's work on developing the ability in clients to tolerate emotional distress, 
and can downregulate emotional distress. You know, if you can teach people how to do that, then when they are activated, when they are triggered, when they are feeling hyper aroused, they can then invoke this, these learned skills that allow them to get less deeply into the negative emotional state. In some sense, this is another angle at processing trauma. One would be to use exposure to reduce the distress associated with the memory. This would be to increase the ability to tolerate the distress associated with the memory. Uh, so we have a lot of ways in which we can talk about that. One thing is we can teach the client de-escalation skills, and there's a number of these, but among other things, how to ground yourself, how to feel yourself present, to notice the world around you. Uh, we can do breath training, which is teaching you how to breathe in a way that calms you down as opposed to keeping you tense. It turns out that if we breathe in a calm way, we tend to become more calm. If we breathe in an anxious way, we actually become more anxious. So if we can teach the vet how to actually breathe, as strange as it sounds, or any of us, if we can learn that skill, the individual can actually learn to reduce distress just in the way that they're breathing. We'll also get more directly focused on arousal reduction by teaching other kinds of skills. Relaxation training is very helpful in many cases, where one learns to relax one entire body in, in, in one way or another, and a number of different methodologies out there. But if you can actually learn to reduce your emotional distress by relaxing your body, you're obviously going to be in a much better situation uh, at times of distress. Uh, a number of us are working with, both in our own lives as well as in our clients' lives, with the use of meditation as a very helpful way to, to intervene in people that are post-traumatically stressed, who are hyper-aroused, who are suffering the effects of, of major trauma. Meditation can take many different forms. It doesn't have to be a Buddhist perspective. It could be, an, it could be a Christian form of meditation. It could be... Uh, it could be the Kabbalah, it could be Sufi dancing. There's a million different things that we humans call meditative. But the notion that you could learn contemplative skills that allow one to experience one's internal states in a different way um, is something that's becoming more and more important uh, in the psychotherapy field as we're beginning to understand that uh, some of the best interventions for psychological stress do not come from Western psychology. So meditation is becoming quite an important part of it and something that, that I certainly uh, talk about a lot. And then lastly, medication is going to be some, not something that the, that the war vet's going to be able to do for themselves, but, but what, one of our jobs obviously is to increase the client's access to medical care so that they can receive appropriate medication. By medication here, by the way, I'm not talking about major sedating drugs that basically take the veteran out of their ongoing experience, but instead the newer uh, medications that are used, such as the SSRIs and other drugs, that seem to have some specific helpfulness in working with PTSD. Some of the SSRIs, for example, are the only drugs uh, indicated by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, can be helpful for PTSD. And it's going to be important for people to be able to access those meds when they're relevant. We can do something called trigger identification and, and intervention. What this basically means is uh, that we can work with the, with the vet to figure out what in the world right now triggers him back into Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam, or even what in the current world triggers him or her back into the, his or her child abuse experiences. We, can, we actually have procedures wherein clients can work with the therapist to figure out how do they know when they're being triggered, what is a trigger, and what could they do when they've been triggered. In that way, what the client ultimately gets a chance to do is have more control over these kind of intrusive internal states. We call that trigger identification and intervention. And then there's the notion of mindfulness, which goes hand in hand with meditation. But uh, as you may know, some of the interventions, mindfulness interventions out there, do not teach the client how to meditate. They try to go directly to some specific ways of increasing mindfulness. Mindfulness, by the way, here, I mean, it can be defined many ways, but let's say mindfulness minimally is the ability, and it's a skill that you can develop, to be aware of and experience your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions without judging them and to some extent accepting them. And this kind of notion that you could experience your internal state without being actually that involved in your internal state, that you could just watch your feelings come and go, your thoughts come and go, your memories come and go, can be a very powerful affect regulation device because in some sense what eventually can occur is that you, you don't take your internal states quote as seriously as 
maybe you did in another time in your life. When you feel a very strong feeling, instead of saying, oh my God, I'm losing it, I'm crazy, etc., you might just say, I'm having this thought, or I'm having this feeling. This is obviously a whole topic we could spend an awful lot of time on, but as you'll see in the, in the actually, where was that one? Well, somewhere in, the, in your slides here, you'll see that there actually are um, uh, a number of empirically validated treatment techniques that can teach people how to develop greater mindfulness that can be helpful with anxiety disorders and post-traumatic states. Well, we're almost out of time. I just uh, want to, and I will talk about this in the second hour as well, I just want to really emphasize the notion that one of the bigger mistakes people can make in treating chronically traumatized people is to leave their families out, their communities out, their religious organizations, their clubs, their their primary resources. It turns out that social support is a major buffer for how people handle trauma. And social support is probably one of the central notions of the human condition. Do we have people to go to who will listen to us, who won't judge us, who will understand us? Of course, it's going to be hard for them because of the things that I described before, but it's still going to be very important. Um, so relational supports are going to be very helpful there. Um, we, we also, of course, have to support the supporter. Uh, it's very, very hard to be in a family where uh, a family member is a combat vet or if your partner is a combat vet or a war vet or has been exposed to major trauma. It's very grueling and demanding for significant others in the family. So most of us not only work to utilize the relational resources of, of the vet in the work, we also have to then do some work with the relational resources to provide support for them because what they're doing is, is a tremendous, uh, powerful, but, but uh, almost overwhelming task. Uh, I, think, I think I'm pretty much there, done there. Do you have any questions? Or? I will kind of kick this part off with, uh, with an observation, and I'd be grateful for your comments on it. Uh, you mentioned that war, in a way, is the opposite of relating intimately. Um, maybe because of that, uh, or in spite of that, uh, what I've noticed is that the, the war veteran will bond and develop a, a, a connection of deep love and loyalty and support for his or her buddies in country. And actually, when, when they return uh, from theater, the discrepancy between the level of intimacy with their cohort and their family members and their friends. This could be family of origin or their immediate family, even sometimes with their children. Uh, the, the discrepancy is what strikes them and uh, leaves them very depressed and, and very blue and sometimes longing for the kind of love and mutual support that comes in the midst of extreme trauma and that supports them during that. So I just wonder if you want to comment on I that? I would really agree with that. I think there are multiple variables that play out here. One is, again, that the only people that could really understand what you're going through are people who shared the experience with you. And because there's a lot of feeling of isolation and alienation by people who are returning home, uh, they can't tell their families, they can't tell others what's really going on to a great extent, so they don't get a chance to really do that communication that would be helpful for them. Um, it's also true that, that this is probably some version of traumatic bonding, which is that those relationships that they had with their peers out there um, may f feel to them like the ultimate level of connection that anyone could have with anyone, and family members may fall short of that. But in some cases, what you're seeing is that it's a certain kind of intimacy. It's the intimacy is sort of associated with having felt something really very been in a very dangerous situation or a very powerful situation, having someone there next to you. But it isn't the kind of intimacy that may in fact translate into other needs that human beings have. So it's even in some ways worse than just that your family members can't measure up to your buddies. It's also that your buddies can only do what they can do and, and the, the relevance of them to your current experience is limited. So you'll find these strange situations where people will, say, be in a squad together, and all they talk about is the people in the squad. And when they get together, they can only talk about war, and they can only talk about experiences that they had, and they may not actually ultimately find that as reinforcing as, as they might want it to be. We also see that numbing is, is a very important aspect of post-traumatic response to war, which is that um, a lot of people will experience that when they return home, they have a relatively reduced ability to feel loving feelings. And these loving feelings 
um, may be very distressing to the veteran who's been thinking about his or her partner all this time, can't wait to come back and see that person or the kids or the dog or whoever it might be. And then when they do get back, they find that something's missing, that they're feeling some kind of emptiness inside. In those contexts, uh, it seems to me that a lot of times people try to sort of go back to war, go back to where it sort of made sense. I've heard vets say to me, uh, you know, this is way worse than war. I wish I was just out where people were shooting at me. Uh, at least I understood what was going on there. It was chaotic and horrible. But this, I don't understand this. Why does she want this? Why does he want this? Why is my kid crying, et cetera? But that, that disjointed experience of returning to your relational environment is, is very, very difficult. And I, it's another reason why we want to involve the families and the partners in the treatment when we can, because this is not something that's going to get better miraculously through the administration of a drug or the effective use of exposure therapy. This is stuff that's going to have to slowly work its way through the relational system for the person. We have a, a question. Um, uh, is it appropriate or indicated in the history taking of childhood to explore attachment categories, uh, for example, insecure, disorganized categories? Well, it's often something that, that, that we do in our clinical work with individuals who have trauma histories in childhood. Uh, when it relates to the veteran, it becomes a more complex issue. I don't think that we so much really focus on attachment styles or relational schema in, in trying to treat the traumatized war veteran. On the other hand, we're constantly being aware of those issues. For instance, if the, if the war veteran has a dismissive avoidance style, she's, she or he is not going to want you to get all smushy with him or her because that's not how that person's operating. If the person has a, a um, uh, you know, some sort of a preoccupied attachment, they may become highly dependent on the therapist and take the slightest, minutest little lack of complete accurate empathy is evidence of great loss and abandonment. So we keep those things in mind. The only difference is, I would say, is when we're working in war trauma, we have to be a little bit more focused on the specific presentation as it relates to, to combat-related symptomatology. So we would use attachment to inform how we, we might work with that trauma material, but we probably wouldn't therapeutically engage it in the same way we might with other individuals. <laughs> 